Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of C++ Best Practices. So this is a series where we look at some of the you know, better coding habits of writing modern C++. So one of the common ideas that you might see, you know, as far as writing good C++ will be this idea or this technique called RAII, which stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. So to kind of sum, you know, this entire you know, article up that I'll link below, um, about the language, it basically talks about binding the life cycle of some resource. So something like, you know, heap allocated memory that we get from malloc or new, or something like a mutex or locked mutex to the lifetime of an object, right? And a concrete example of this would be, you know, having a constructor for say an object do some kind of dynamic allocation, and then having the destructor of the object free that allocation, right? Then we no longer have to worry about um, you know, something, things like memory leaks, right? Those be, these become less important issues because, you know, memory is all automatically getting freed when an object goes out of scope. So let's look at a couple concrete examples of RAII in practice. So we'll look at a memory allocation one and one dealing with locks. So the first one we'll look at, we'll have this very simple object. So we'll call it resource. It'll just be a struct. And it has a constructor and a destructor. So the constructor says, you know, when resource... Uh, it just prints out that a resource object has been created and the destructor says, you know, a resource object has been destroyed. So inside of our main function, we'll look at a non-RAII approach. So, you know, in this approach, we're just, you know, creating, uh, we're, you know, heap allocating or doing a dynamic allocation here by calling new on resource. So we're just allocating space for one of these uh, resource objects here, right? But the problem with this is that, you know, later on, you know, you know after some time, we'll have to eventually call delete, right, in order to free this memory. If we forget to free this memory, right, and then all of a sudden maybe we lose the pointer or the pointer goes out of scope that actually, you know, points to this, you know, object that we've allocated, um, you know, this would be known as a memory leak, right? So we've allocated some memory and we can no longer free it because we don't know where it exists, right? So this is a problem, right? And especially because this code, so I've got says, I say, you know, some code here. So the space between our, uh, the creation or allocation for some uh, region of memory that we've allocated, there's some heap allocation, it can be very, very far from when, you know, we finally want to free it or destroy it. So, you know, if we're leaving it up to the programmer to decide, okay, I should free this piece of memory now, right? It's easy for a programmer to make mistakes about this. So, you know, one way that we can get around this is by using smart pointers. So we can use something like a unique pointer from uh, memory up here, this header. We can use a unique pointer to basically do the allocation for this resource. So we can say, I want a unique pointer. I'm gonna call it R2. I'm gonna initialize it with, you know, an allocation of this resource. But the thing is, I don't need to worry about freeing here, right? As soon as this unique pointer goes out of scopes, it will go ahead and free uh, my allocation, right? So I don't need to worry about the free anymore. So that's this idea of RAII, right? So inside of the constructor, we're doing an allocation of some resource. And then in the destructor, right, resource will get freed. So we can show that by, you know, if we go ahead and quit out of this and we compile our memory allocation example, we go ahead and run it. We see that, you know, just calling new and delete, right? We see that both the constructor and destructor get called. And then, you know, using a, uh, a smart pointer, right, or a unique pointer, Right? we see that both the constructor and the destructor get called. So we don't have a memory leak, but we also didn't have to worry about explicitly calling free there. It happened automatically. All right, so let's look at another example. So let's look at one with locks. So this can be a very dangerous one when we're talking about you know, parallel programming, right? We wanna avoid things like deadlocks. So here we'll have you know, a very simple function. So we've got, um, we've got this global mutex that's gonna say, um, our critical section inside of our code is going to be printing, for, you know, from the C out um, stream, right? So, you know, we don't want multiple threads to be using C out at the same time. Uh, the reason for that is because we could end up getting jumbled text in the output um, as they when they both try to get access to this output stream. So, how do we avoid that? You know, if we're printing from multiple streams, well, we can just go ahead and put a lock around it. So we can lock this mutex, and then we can unlock it after we're done printing, right? So, you know, here's how we go ahead and code that up. You know, as a simple example, we just create a thread T1 for print func, a thread T2 for this print func, and then eventually join these two threads. So we see that down here, right, we'll call our, the same print function, right, or we'll call a print function down here, um, except this time, right, let's go ahead and change it to call this better print func, right? So let's go ahead and change this down here to, you know, 
you know, better print func, and then better print func. And it has the exact same functionality for printing, but it's a bit safer because instead of using just you know mutex.lock and mutex.unlock, right now I'm going to go ahead and use a lock guard. Right, so I go ahead and create a lock guard with my uh, you know passing my mutex to it. And what this basically does is that it creates an object called the lock guard. And then when the object goes out of scope, right, or when it gets, you know, destroyed, it goes ahead and automatically frees the mutex. So, you know, for the same reason that, you know, we might forget to unlock, that's one, you know, potential pitfall of this. Another pitfall is that what if something happens, like an exception gets thrown, and, you know, maybe I never reach my unlock portion of my code, right, from one of my threads, right? So that can be dangerous. But if I go ahead and just create, you know, a lock guard, right, then I don't need to worry about it because as long as it goes out of scope and the destructor fires or gets called, I'll go ahead and make sure that, you know, um, I for, you know, this mutex gets unlocked. So if we go ahead and show this by, uh, you know, if we go ahead and compile, you know, locks, um, oops, and then we go ahead and link against uh, lib uh, pthread just for the uh, implementation of the actual threading. Right, you see that they all say printing from a thread, but it's very easy if you know something happens and I forget to say unlock right from this print func right here, right over here in my better print func. I don't need to worry about calling unlock because as soon as the lock guard goes out of scope, it automatically frees the lock. But for the other one, I have to explicitly call unlock. So if we go ahead and compile this again, we see that I get a deadlock. Right, so this program will never actually exit because I basically have a lock. Right, then it returns from the function never gets unlocked so the other thread can never grab the lock it's always still waiting there all right so that's some basic examples or some practical examples of raii this idea of resource acquisition is initialization so any of this code can be found in my github page at github.com coffee before arch i have a ton of different series here on you know c plus programming cuda programming python parallel programming you know etc so here we're looking at C++ best practices. So you can check out this code under RAII. Last time we looked at this idea of, you know, using const uh, in practice and how that can force some, you know, even some better performance. Um, so that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode. You know, as I said, all these examples are here. I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.